All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together this evening, an evening that you've ordained for us, of course, to, to teach us, to instruct us in the Word, to exhort us, to encourage us. Father, this world is crazy, and you've put us in it, Father, and we've got to navigate it with your help, of course. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for showing us the way through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for without him, I don't know where any of us would be, Father. It would just be awful. So thank you, Father, on this Christmas season as it approaches. Thank you for reminding us of the things that really matter in this world, things that make a difference, things that have eternal weight. Father, thank you for all these things. These are grace gifts to our souls. Father, we pray for those that can't be with us this morning due to, or this evening due to illness or what have you. We just pray for their return. Your will be done, of course. We pray for those that are still lost in this world, for there are many. We are most grateful and thankful for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and to make an evening like this a reality. We do just ask your blessings on this evening's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, this is a fantastic series. Uh, you know how I really know? Because there's a lot of missing people. <laughs> and uh, people get dragged away for a variety of reasons. I'm not judging anyone. I'm just saying what, you know, the, it just coincides. So, uh, anyways... I don't know about you, but I've been really enjoying the series so far, and we're only on part four, uh, even though I have personally been getting my rear end handed to me. Um, remember that everything that goes, uh, comes from this pulpit goes through this vessel first, um, and so uh, you're not alone. Um, nonetheless, I love it, and I hope you do too. I have received a lot of positive feedback on the, on the topic of judging. That's been sort of a subtitle the last two, three lessons, um, a lot of good feedback on the topic of judging uh, as a result of what the Spirit's been saying from the pulpit. Um, to cut to the chase on that topic, I think the net net is that the Bible demands that we judge righteously. The Bible demands it, and it's that simple. We shouldn't be PC about it, politically correct about it. We shouldn't be uh, browbeat or um, embarrassed or ashamed to uh, hold to this biblical truth that we are demanded to judge righteously. That is why the Lord has given us a good conscience as the vehicle by which the Spirit himself is able to convict us. And as we know also from Holy Scripture, the Spirit uses the Word of God as the instrument for convicting us. So just to summarize, the Spirit uses the Word to convict our consciences of right and wrong. The Spirit uses the Word to convict our consciences of right and wrong. The correct biblical word for this, drum roll, judging. The Spirit uses the Word to convict our consciences of right and wrong. The correct biblical term for that is judging. We judge rightly. That's what we have a good conscience for. That's what the Spirit does, helps us with, and what the Word gives us a, a bar for. Um, even Jesus, as we noted on Tuesday, asks us to judge. Go to John 7.24. John 7.24. This shouldn't be anything um, that we're ashamed of or anything that we should shy away from. There's nothing wrong with righteous judging. And a matter of fact, it's commanded. John 7.24. But you see how Satan works. and This is really a good lead-in to the deception of sin, to the deceitfulness of sin. Because if, you, if, if, if the world robs us of a, a viable, righteous word like judging, don't judge me, where are we left? We're left with some form of guilt for actually judging in any realm, which is uh, wrong. So John 7, 24, do not judge according to appearance. So there are pitfalls when it comes to judging, but judge with righteous judgment. So says Jesus. 
Go ahead, don't make the mistake according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Um, and I believe that the Bible teaches us as we grow up in the faith, that judgment becomes sharper and sharper over time. Why? Because we have more of the Word of God. The corollary to the principle that Jesus has given us is up here in the board on judging. Our flesh is so trained to draw conclusion from conclusions from what is seen. The Bible tells us the righteous man shall live by faith. Again, our flesh is so trained to draw conclusions from what is seen. The Bible tells us the righteous man shall live by faith. Romans 1.17 I really enjoyed the pair of quotes that Scott gave us from Tozer this past week. I'm going quickly because uh, we've already covered enough ground, I think, on the topic of judging, but for whatever reason, the Spirit really wants to impress these things upon you. But as we transition into the deceitfulness of sin, which is our series, uh, I'll quote Tozer again. A.W. Tozer up here on the board. The world of sense intrudes upon our attention day and night for the whole of our lifetime. It is clamorous, insistent, and self-demonstrating. It does not appeal to our faith. It is here assaulting our five senses, demanding to be accepted as real and final. That's the deception of sin. That's the deceitfulness of sin. Sin says, accept what these things are, as real and final, when the Bible says it's by faith that we're able to judge righteously. But this is what Tozer is talking about, using our senses, so to speak. Again, this speaks directly to our series titled The Deceitfulness of Sin. The second quote is also just as edifying up here on the board. But sin has so clouded the lenses of our hearts that we cannot see that other reality, the city of God, shining around us. The world of sense triumphs. The visible becomes the enemy of the invisible and the temporal of the eternal. That is the curse inherited by every member of Adam's tragic race. At the root of the Christian life lies belief in the invisible. The object of the Christian's faith is unseen reality and so that becomes the basis of all judging um, as well but then again this is the this is our leading into the deceitfulness of sin this is something we have read many times in hebrews 11 as well as second corinthians 5 verse 7 which reads for we walk by faith not by sight and i ask you i ask you look around you both literally and figuratively, over the next few days. You've got, it's Thursday, you've got till Sunday. We don't regather again until Sunday. Take the time. Look around, both literally and figuratively, <clears throat> and look at how very complex the God of this world has made life. I mean, I think about Christmas right now, in the moment. There's going to be a ton of little kids getting a bunch of toys with batteries in them. And their senses are going to be completely overwhelmed for like a week straight. And then they go back to, to Tammy in first grade and drive her nuts. You know what I'm saying? Kids are completely overwhelmed. And they think that's what Christmas is all about. This high they get for a whole week. New toys, new lights, new sounds, new records, new video games, new everything. And it's an overload of senses, and they think that's what Christmas is. And it's just this awfulness, this awful distraction. And it's very complex because it's overwhelming to the senses. Sight, sound, taste. I mean, who doesn't overeat? I mean, you're probably going to eat about 40 cookies this season, right? Is that fair? Maybe more? I don't know. You're going to eat all kinds of pie. You're going to eat stuff that's not good for your body. Uh, it's just everything. Taste, smell. You're going to smell. What, you think Christmas, don't you smell or have a certain smell? All that stuff is just a bombardment. And it's supposed to be one simple thing. Can we celebrate the birth of our Lord? Can we celebrate the birth of our Lord? Even the celebrations are complicated, are complex. People are jumping off bridges. 
I was driving today and I heard on the radio, bah hum, nobody wants Christmas. One guy lived near the mall. He's like, it takes, he says, I can see my house. It takes me a half an hour to drive to my house on the way home because I'm stuck in mall traffic because I live next door to the mall. It's nuts. So look around at how very complex the God of this world has made life. Look at the lack of solidarity, peace, and contentment in the souls of mankind. Nothing is ever assured us. Even if we have something tangible like a written contract, nothing's ever assured anymore. Standing directly opposite of this, all of this, is the Word of God, Jesus Christ, which the Bible describes this way in Hebrews 13, 8, up here on the board. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I just feel like it's going, oh, thank you. There's at least one constant in this world, one thing that hasn't been complicated, one thing. Ask yourselves, what is more complex? The world system that we just talked about or Jesus Christ? What's more, compl what's more complicated? What, what brings more angst into your soul? The world or Jesus Christ? Who never changes? The prior, the world, changes so much that the secular proverb stands true. The only constant in this life is change. I believe that because I believe I know what the world is all about. The only constant in this life is change. The latter, Jesus Christ, never changes. So says Holy Scripture, Hebrews 13, 8. We just we see it on the board. So let me ask you another basic question before I pop another principle on you. What is another name for an answer. In other words, when someone says, I want an answer, what are they actually asking for? The answer to that is the truth. I want an answer. What are they asking for? I just want the truth. Tell me the truth. I want an answer. Go to John 1.14. John 1.14. So I'm adding to that. Jesus Christ never changes. The word is, is just chaos. I mean, excuse me, the world is just chaos. It stands in opposition to Jesus Christ. John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Again, I want an answer. What's, what's someone looking for? The truth. Okay? Jesus Christ, who never changes, is dubbed, if you would, biblically, as full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace... For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So, when someone says, I want answers, what they are really asking for is Jesus Christ. I want answers. I can't take Christmas time anymore. I can't take, from, from Thanksgiving to Christmas, I just feel like going in, like a bear and hibernating. And then emerging afterwards. I want to know what is going on. I want answers. You want Jesus Christ. You want to see through all this garbage, all this complexity? You want Jesus Christ. He's your answer. Up here on the board. The truth is simple. Remember, he never changes. He's immutable. The great thing about Jesus Christ is that he has all the answers because he is truth incarnate. We just read that. John 1, 14 to 17. That's the beautiful thing about Jesus Christ. And he never changes his mind. Sin deceives us into believing that Jesus does not have all the answers. Rather, we must consult the world to find them. This is a lie. This is a 
lie. But this is the introduction this evening to the deceitfulness of sin. Jesus does have all the answers. Jesus has always had all the answers. Jesus never changes, so he will always have all the answers. Sin deceives us into believing that he does not have all the answers. The practical side is, as we learned on Tuesday up here on the board, keeping it simple can lead to all the answers. Simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ, the one who never changes. The rock. I loved what Scott said on Tuesday. He said, stop trying, when he, of course he's got the evangelist heart, stop trying to match wits with people when trying to evangelize them. Keep it simple. Let God do his job. Stop trying to match wits with people. Again, our series is titled, The Deceitfulness of Sin. The emphasis is not necessarily to exhaustively define sin, although we have been given compact working definitions for obvious reasons. I need to communicate with you. You need to understand what I mean when I say sin. I want you to have the right perspective, the right angle into our study. Again, the emphasis of this series is really on the deceitfulness of sin. I need you to hold fast to that. This isn't about me uh, defining sin. We'd be doing a heck of a lot more work. Uh, we'd be going Old Testament, New Testament. We'd be doing a heck of a lot more work. Probably a little word study here and there. We're not doing that. We're talking about the deceitfulness of sin. So the presumption is you have at least a working knowledge of sin. I was thinking about this. I've never met a true believer that doesn't understand that sin exists. Never. I mean, a person has to understand that sin exists to even repent, which is a part of the gospel call, if you would. So I've never met a true believer that doesn't understand that sin exists. However, every believer I've ever met has been deceived by sin. It's not that we don't understand that sin exists, but every believer I've ever met and every believer you've ever met has been deceived by sin and continues to struggle with it every day. Up here on the board, the futility of human flesh. We are incapable of beating sin at its own game. The nature of sin is that it is deceptive. This means that its first order of business is to go unidentified. Unidentified. Only the light of the Word is able to illuminate sin, identify it, and then deal with it. And I know there's a lot in there. We're going to sort of expand this uh, this evening, but this is where we're beginning we are incapable of beating sin at its own game. Why? Because even the father of lies, Satan himself, he's the perfect proof point. We're not as smart as him. We're not as wild. We don't have the wild. We're not as wily as him. Um, we get beat when we play sin's game. When, like Scott said about evangelizing, try to match wits with something ancient, something. Uh, with a, a strategy that surpasses anything we could conjure up. We are incapable of beating sin in its own game. The nature of sin is that it is deceptive. This means that its first order of business is to go unidentified. Only the light of the Word is able to illuminate sin, identify it, and then deal with it. So, one of the key reasons for the series is to turn the lights on in our souls. Because when we turn the lights on, what we see is how sin is operating in our lives. And we didn't know it. It's like turning the lights on and, you know, the rat's over there eating the cheese on you. You didn't know. You turn the floodlights on the front lawn and there's a, a gopher out there. I don't, do we have gophers around here? Okay, we have gophers around here. There's a gopher out there eating the cabbage. I don't know who has cabbage on the front lawn. <laughs> but some people do. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm getting at? It's not until we turn the lights on. We just think, how's that happening? How is it magically? How is the cabbage not growing? 
I don't know. Turn the lights on. Oh, it's these things. That's sin. Sin is wreaking havoc in each of our lives, and we haven't even identified it yet. So the reason for this series is to turn the lights on in our souls. For starters, we must understand what sin has done to mankind. In other words, what's the starting point? Go to Isaiah 64, verse 6. Isaiah 64, verse 6. We have to have the lights turned on. Some of you don't want it, and I would, I would venture to guess at least one person that's not here this evening doesn't want it. That's why they're not here. Really does not like the whole idea of this series because it's illuminating things in their soul that stink. Isaiah 64, verse 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds, not some, all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. We don't even, we think we're doing what's, we think we're doing righteous stuff and it smells to the high heavens and it takes us away. That's what sin tells us. That's what the world tells us. Isn't that what we train up our children to do in America? Be good little girls and boys? Achieve, do all these things that are relatively good? Isn't that what we teach our children nowadays? In the public institutions, of course, that's exactly. But you know what? Filthy garment. Those are the things that are taking our children away. These are the things that got these kids all confused about what matters in life. And then they wonder, I mean, you have kids that are on um, concoctions, cocktails of drugs just to get through high school because every other kid is depressed. Every third kid is bipolar. Every fourth kid is this. Every fifth kid is this. Nobody can cope anymore. Geez, I wonder why. I wonder why. Our righteous deeds are those things we do in the power of the flesh. Sure, there's a relative goodness. We talked about this Sunday and Tuesday. There's a relative goodness to them, but God does not account them to us as righteous. Anything less than perfect is unholy. And anything done in the flesh isn't holy. So there's a relative goodness. I mean, it's good that you didn't, you know, run that person off the road yesterday when they cut you off and, you know, turn out to be a murderer, somebody who purposely drove somebody into a train. It's good that you didn't do that. I mean, it's good that you helped the old lady with her luggage or whatever at the airport. I mean, it's good. You know, that's relative good. But God looks at that and sees the heart and says... It was tainted. Because when you helped the old lady, you looked around to see if anybody was looking. It was tainted. It's not holy. Holiness is perfect. Your motivation wasn't perfect. So I can't count it as righteousness. Paul wrote about this too. Go to Philippians 3, verse 7. Philippians 3, verse 7. I hope you're prepared because we are going to be among the most unpopular churches in in this area for some time now. And we're going to be very popular for the demons, but we're going to be very unpopular in this world. Philippians 3, 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Who would give up all their... All right, ask... Um, the average 10-year-old boy this Christmas, would you give up everything you got under the tree for Jesus Christ? Seriously, what do you think most of them would say? Can I play with them first? Well, then I count all things to be lost and view the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of, righteousness of my own derived from the law, 
but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Now let's put the principle on the board in context now. Again, the principle on the board, we are incapable of beating sin at its own game. The nature of sin is that it is deceptive. You have to think of that way. You have to think about sin itself. It's not going to just stand there. You know, it's not going to go, here I am. If you're willing, here I am. It doesn't do that. It hides. You turn your focus there, it goes like this. You turn your focus there, it goes like that. You turn it there, it goes like that. It's not interested in staying in your view. So it darts out of the way. It evades your attention even because it does not want to be identified. As soon as you are able to identify, you know when the lights come on, when you read the Word of God, as soon as you're able to identify a sin, now you've got it, and it can't move because it's in the spotlight. It doesn't want that. It doesn't want you learning the Word of God. The question begging to be answered is the one that peels back the onion in all our lives. I mean, sin's bad, right? I don't know about you, but I really don't want it in my life. Um, How does sin go undetected? How does sin go undetected? I'll give you the answer in Holy Scripture. Go to Matthew 6, 1. Matthew 6, verse 1. Jesus was a master of drawing out the truth about the sinfulness of man. And the self-righteousness, if you look at what Jesus Christ revolted against the most, it was self-righteousness. Now you have to cling to that. You have to say, what is the deal? Why did he pounce so heavily on self-righteousness? Well, let's read. We'll see. Matthew 6, 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness. You know, remember the filthy garment stuff. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you... When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal." For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye, now this is where he gets to the point. The eye is the lamp of the body. 
So then, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. What he's saying, basically, if you think you're righteous and you're not, how great is your darkness? If you're a self-righteous jackass, he gave us how many examples? If you give or you pray, or you do all these things, you help, whatever it is, and you do it for the sake of self-righteousness, um, how great is your darkness? When you think that is something to behold, how great is your darkness? And that's the deception or the deceitfulness of sin. Because we're all going to go out, I don't know, tonight or tomorrow, do something lovely for somebody and go, <laughs> and be, just because of the incumbent value system, the self-righteousness that went along with this little thing, exists, it's unholy. It's tainted. It's ruined. How many times are we going to do that this, this season? And say, well, oh, well, we're just trying to discover, well, how does, okay, so the question on the table is, what, how, do, how does sin go undetected? That's how. It, <laughs> it flies right under your self-righteousness. That's how. That's why a lot of people have to be put back on their heels. That's one of the jobs of the pastor, to put people back on their heels and say, you're not that righteous. Get off your little horsey. You're not that righteous. Big deal. You did this thing. Why are you even telling me about it? That right there says it's garbage. Isn't that what Jesus just said? Do it in secret then. Do you get it? Why do I even know about these things that you're doing for other people? I always get a kick out of that. You ever notice that? Why can't a politician just go to a, a, a hospital and, and, uh, and, and encourage some children? No, they've got to take an entourage of cameras. Why? They make it look so natural, though, like, oh, no, everybody forgets. Even the preachers, I've seen preachers do it. How is there always a camera following this guy around? And he's acting all natural like there's no camera there. Do people forget there's actually a camera there? What is he pitching here besides himself as an icon? What are we doing? Do you know what I'm saying? What are we doing? Are we pitching Christ? Are we doing things in secret? Are we doing things so that people see us? What are we doing? That's the deceitfulness of sin. That's how sin goes undetected, you see. It hides behind self-righteousness. And if then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? All right, so here's the answer to the question that instigated our reading this passage up here on the board. How does sin go undetected? The answer, Matthew 6, 23, when we exchange truth for a lie, light for darkness, good for bad, bitter for sweet, etc. Isaiah 5, 20, up here on the board, says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If you do that, Jesus just laid it out. He said, ah, you might do something relatively good. You might get a pat on the back from some good people. But that's your reward. Because my Father in Heaven goes, wrong motivation. I looked at your heart. Your heart was bad. I'm going to use it for good over here for the old lady. But for you, I'm not accounting it as righteousness. But that's between me and the old lady, you see. Let me elaborate. If we can't see our enemy, it's impossible for us to fight it. Even worse is when we are so twisted that we think the enemy is our friend. I mean, who doesn't like to get an attaboy? Come on, who doesn't? Attaboy! Nice job, nice job. Who doesn't like to get that? That's your friend, right? I mean, it makes you feel good, it's friendly. Yeah, but you just turned into a puffed up jackass. So was it really your friend? Or was it a seduction from the world? I mean, who doesn't go to work and, and, and seek approval of, you know, the powers that be? And who doesn't thirst for that thing? When all along, it's the enemy just enticing and seducing you one step closer to walking away, to being dragged away for a time or something. Who knows? Up here on the board, this is what I know from Scripture 
and from personal experience, and I'm sure most of you can attest, the deceitfulness of sin, sin poses as a friend, as something good, even righteous for us. That's what sin does. I'm your friend. Let me in. Let me bunk with you. Let's be bunk mates. Let's do this thing. Let's make it happen. Let's set some goals. Five-year goals, ten-year goals. Go to the New York bestseller list. There's always some kind of self-help program out there, right? Some guy making a bazillion dollars off of telling people, I don't know, probably ripped off wisdom from the Bible anyways. But nonetheless, sin poses as a friend, as something good, even righteous for us. Go to Psalm 55, 21. Don't believe me? This is what the Bible tells us. We're, we're, we're investigating the deceitfulness of sin. We're asking ourselves right now, how does sin go undetected? How does it go undetected? Because, well, it poses as a friend, as something good, even righteous for us. Tends to build us up, tends to tell us we're all, you know, tends to tell us we're righteous. But here's what the Bible says about our enemy. Psalm 55, 21. His, the enemy in in view, his speech was smoother than butter, but his heart was war. His words were softer than oil yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. In other words, drop the seduction. See it for what it is. Everybody in here is being seduced right now by something or someone, or multiple someones or multiple somethings. Everybody in here is being seduced. In some way or another. And I'm not just, it could be romantic, could be usually something else, could be both, who knows. Everybody in here is being seduced. Some of you are wise enough to realize and see it for what it is, and you call it out, and you run away from it. You run away. It's like when I taught about dating. You don't have the strength <laughs> to sit next to someone that you're that attracted to and not have bad thoughts. Do you understand? You don't have the strength to do it. A weaker person says, but I never touched her, so I didn't sin. Or I never touched him, so... Uh-huh. Yeah, we're talking about this right here. See, those are the people, as I've been teaching, they just want a list of sins. Give me these sins. I'll set up this list. As long as I don't touch her or do this or whatever it is, you know, whatever it is, or touch whatever, whoever, whatever it is that's seducing you, as long as you don't engage in that thing, you're good. Wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong, dead wrong. Wrong again. Just saying. Huh. One of the greatest traps a man can fall into is adultery. One of the greatest traps a man can fall into is adultery. And let's face it, our enemies will work overtime through the weaker vessel to convince us that something so wrong is actually good for us. That some relationship that violates the marriage bed is actually favorable over that which God provides by grace. Again, such is the very nature of sin. I don't bring up, uh, the Bible is the one who's bringing this stuff up. So, if any of you have been uh, involved in any of this, don't look at me. This is the Spirit speaking. Such is the very nature of sin. It appeals to us as something good to have. But the Bible says emphatically that it is not. Again, what's the point on the board? Sin poses as a friend as something good, even righteous for us. Let's see what Solomon, the wisest man of his time, according to the Bible, has to say about this subject. Go to Proverbs 5.1. Proverbs 5.1. And there is a reason why the Bible frequently, I wouldn't say frequently, but frequently enough uses the institution of marriage and the attacks on that institution to reveal the seductive nature of sin, the deceitfulness of sin, how it is like a serpent, it slips in, it's smooth as butter, but the heart is war. Do you understand? Smooth as butter. 
Proverbs 5.1, My son, Solomon, wisest man of his time, my son, give attention to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, that you may observe discretion, and your lips may reserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and smoother than oil is her speech. Again, the question on the table is, how does sin go undetected? Smoother than oil is her speech. Verse 4, But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She does not know it. How great is your darkness when you think you're in the light. Now then, my sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, don't even go near that, su that seductive engine. And we can translate this into sin itself. Adultery is just one sin. It's a perfect illustration of the seduction of sin. What's Solomon saying from an incredible wisdom? Don't even go near it. In other words, it's like a magnet, right? If you're a positive magnet and there's a negative magnet over there, don't even go into the force field of that thing because you're just going to get sucked in. Don't even go near it. <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> you know, you do a couple of loops. Next thing you know, you get closer, closer, and closer. Next thing you know... Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, or you will give your vigor to others, and your years to the cruel one. And strangers, look at verse 10, and strangers will be filled with your strength, and your hard-earned goods will go to the house of an alien. And you groan at your final end, when your flesh and your body are consumed. And you say, how have I hated instruction, and my heart spurned reproof. I have not listened to the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to my instructors. I was almost an utter ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. Drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well, says God. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving, hind, and grateful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. His own iniquities will capture the wicked, and he will be held with the cords of his sin, he will die for lack of instruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. That's what seduction looks like. And Solomon wrote that, not Ed Collins. I'm just reading it with you. Again, the point of the board. Sin poses as a friend, as something good, even righteous for us. But we are warned. We are warned throughout the whole Bible about the deceitfulness of of sin. In particular, we might suppose that we are able to wrangle with sin to the point where it is controlled, you know what I'm saying? Like this little example over here. Oh, I can, I, you know, I can get pretty close. I just want to take a little gander. Mm, yeah, I can see what all the fuss is about. You know what I mean? We think we can control it. We think, oh, I got this under control. You know what I mean? I'm only going to sin on every other Tuesday. Right? See, it's like the alcoholic that goes into a bar. I'm only going to have one. Really? Yep. I've made a decision. I'm only going to have one. You know, you controlling sin, you having any control over sin whatsoever, is never the end goal of sin. 
That might be what you think you can do, but that is never the end goal of sin. Let me, let me explain. Concentrate for a moment. Sin is never satisfied with the status quo. Never. It will never stop trying to consume more and more of you. Never. It's unrelenting. It is utterly tireless in its efforts. The Bible teaches us that sin wants to be master over us. That's that Hebrew word, teshuka. It wants to put you on your back. It doesn't say, hey, let's roll on our sides and play patty cakes. No, it says, I want you on your back. I want you to be completely submissive to me without any partiality to any of this. I'm not going to play patty cakes with you. We're not on equal ground. I want to dominate you. That's sin. So when you think you've got sin under control, you're fooling yourself. You think you struck some kind of a deal with your own sin nature (laughs) or sin in this world. Um, You're playing a, a deadly game. The Bible teaches us that sin wants to master us completely, not partially. Suffice to say, for our studies here, up here on the board, the deceitfulness of sin, you are incapable of controlling sin on your own. And you see, God doesn't play that game. God doesn't say, okay, well, I'll let you play this sort of middle ground game for a little while. No. He says, you want to go dabble in sin, you're on your own. You are incapable of controlling sin on your own. Sin wants to deceive you of this very truth. Oh, trust me. I won't won't hurt you. I'm good. I will never try to control you. And then a week later, they got a little bit more control. And then a week later... You, they've got more control, and then a little bit more. If you ever see, um, like I've watched even in Red and saw documentaries on how people are manipulated, that's how it works. They start off as a, a friend, and then they slowly absorb control from the other person. It's just like an erosive. They're very patient, and it's slowly, and next thing you know, you get Charlie Manson with a bunch of maniacs who he controls like puppets. You are incapable of controlling sin on your own. Sin wants to deceive you of this very truth. It wants you to think that you actually can control it so you don't cut it off. What did we just see in in Proverbs? What did Solomon say? Don't even go near her door. (laughs) In other words, there's the door. You go on this side of the street. Right? Right? You don't even want to get a scent of her perfume because it might be attractive to you. You might be like, ooh. Go on the other side of the street. Take the long way around. Make a point of avoiding the temptation altogether. That would have been good advice for Eve. Just saying. Maybe she should have just stayed away from the tree because that's where the serpent was, right? Just saying. Anyways. Sin wants to deceive you of this very truth. It wants you to think that you actually can control it so that you don't cut it off, so you don't do the smart thing and cut it off. A la Matthew 18, 8 to 9. But you haven't. You can't. You never will. You have never controlled sin. You cannot control sin. And you know what? You never will. Sin just plays a game with you. You're the puppet, not the puppeteer. Sin just plays a game with you. It's trying to gain advantage over you. Satan, the father of lies, the demons, that's all their end goal is to gain advantage over you and let you think that you have some element of control, but you don't. You do not. You haven't, you can't, and you never will. Go to Matthew 18.8. Sin itself, (laughs) this is how 
sin goes undetected. Undetected. It lies to you. It says, oh, you're, you're totally under control. Don't cut me out of your life. Come on. I know I'm wrong. I know I'm this, you know. But don't cut me out because I'm, we kind of have fun together, don't we? We kind of have a lot of fun together. Come on. You want to cut me out? I'm good. I'm just going to stay right here. I won't, I won't try to dominate you. I swear I'll stop texting you all the time. I'll stop calling you all the time. I'll stop haunting your dreams all the time. I'll stop all that stuff. Some of you are like, oh, my God, this is what's happening. Started off as a friend, the next thing you know, man, oh my God, I'm having dreams about this person or this thing. And I now I have no control over it. Yeah, no kidding. Didn't your pastor tell you about this garbage before? Didn't someone, didn't the Bible actually say that this is exactly what happens when you toy with sin? When you think you can control sin? Didn't, didn't the Spirit convict you of this somewhere in your life and you ignored it? Yeah, because you know what? You've never controlled it, you can't control it, and you never will. So go take the other side of the street. Don't get so close to it even. Go around. And if it's in your life, do what Jesus said. Look at Matthew 18, 8. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. You see what he said? Throw it away from you. <laughs> throw it away. And, and don't forget, he's talking about a distance here. Throw it from you. Get it over there, away from you. You don't want it in your life. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. <laughs> throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into fiery hell. Those are the principles, right? Jesus is saying, hey, listen, if something makes you stumble, then cut it off. You're better off lamed. Some of you are like, well, if I cut that out of my life, I'm going to be a lame person. You're better off lame. I'm going, my, my, uh, my social life is going to be maimed. You're better off to be limping through your social life than to have that thing in your life. That's what Jesus is saying. Because that thing is making you stumble. Cut it off. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that you cannot control the thing that is called sin. You must cut it out of your life completely. Cut it out. I didn't say that. You can't look at Pastor Ed and go, oh, this is just pure conjecture. He's just trying to... Oh. I'm not some stiff that's just trying to repress anybody. This is the Word of God. And if you're, if you're actually wise at all, you know exactly what the Spirit's trying to say to you. You're all individuals. You know exactly what the Spirit's trying to say to you personally. There's no guesswork here. I'm not saying anything that's rocket science even, and there's, there's Scripture behind everything that's said. As I shared with you, just as a side note, I've been reading that book, The Total Depravity of Man, by Pink, and this message reminds me of a quote. Um, Pink was describing the allure of sin and that we ought to steer well clear of anywhere where we might fall into it. Steer clear. We, I, I, I taught that probably, what, a few months ago, right? Lifestyle issues. Don't just point to individual sins. Say, see this list of sins? At least I don't do that. At least I'm not a murderer. At least I'm not a this. At least I'm not a that. No, he's saying, if you know better, and you know that if you go on that side of the street, you're probably going to, every tenth time, no, it's not every time, every tenth time you're going to go take a dip into the water over there, you know what I'm saying? Then go this way. And there won't be an every tenth time. There will never be a time because you're not on that side of the street. You can't get yourself in trouble. So... I'm sharing a quote from that book, The Total Depravity of Man. We are expressly told that there is no lion in the way of holiness, that no ravenous beast shall be found there, Isaiah 35, 8-9. No, we have to step out of that way and trespass on the devil's territory before he can get an advantage of us, 2 Corinthians 11. We have to step out of that way, the righteous way, 
and trespass on the devil's territory before he can get an advantage of us. Up here on the board. That is why we are so emphatically enjoined, quote, enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. He's talking about a way. <laughs> He's not even talking about the birth of sin yet. He's talking about a way. The manner in which these people walk. They all walk on that side of the street and they flirt with this thing every time. They go in, they come out, you know, this whole night. Don't even walk that way. Walk over here. That's what the Bible says. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. Pink goes on to discuss the fall in the garden. And frankly, that is where all of our efforts should turn first when contemplating the nature of sin itself. And he addresses the nature, or excuse me, the danger of even approaching something evil. Up here on the board, he's talking about using the fall as his example. We certainly do not regard Eve as being guilty of any sin at this initial stage, but the sequel shows plainly that she incurred great danger and exposed herself to temptation by approaching so near to that tree whose fruit had been divinely prohibited. So he's saying what I just sort of alluded to earlier. Maybe she would have been better off just staying away from the tree altogether. Right? Because you know that that's where Satan would have been slithering around. Like, like, like almost like a trap, right? A set trap. So maybe she would have been better off just avoiding the tree altogether. Just saying. Up here on the board. And we need not be surprised to discover, as she also did, that that ground was already occupied by the serpent. This has been recorded for our learning and warning. In other words, in your life, is there an area of your life that's occupied by the serpent? Are there areas in your life, and I'm speaking figuratively, it could be literally, I don't know, it depends on where you live, I suppose, but figuratively speaking, somewhere in your soul, are there areas in your soul where the serpent is occupying? Are there areas in your life where he treads regularly, knowing that eventually you're going to, you know, kind of like dip your toe in there, and then here goes the whole fight with temptation itself, and as we just talked about, you go there enough time, you are going to fall. You are going to fall. What Pink is highlighting here is what the Bible teaches us on the topic of playing with fire. Up here on the board, and I know that's um, colloquialism. Playing with fire. Sin deceives us into thinking that we can play with fire and not get burned. Sin deceives us into thinking that we can play with fire and not get burned. The truth is that eventually, Given the superior nature of fire, we get burned. We sin. The best strategy is to avoid it, back away, resist it. Allah, Ephesians 6.13, James 4.7, 1 Peter 5.8-9. Go to Ephesians 6.13 quickly. We'll go there. I've got, I got to close. I've got about a minute and a half. <clears throat> Playing with fire. Sin deceives us into thinking that we can play with fire and not get burned. The truth is that eventually, given the superior nature of fire, we get burned. We sin. The best strategy is to avoid it, back away, resist it. Ephesians 6.13. How do you do that? Guess what? Take up the full armor of God. Here it is. You ready? I'm holding up in my hand. You ready? Here it is. Boom, 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 boom. Take up that. Take on the word of God, the full armor, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. That's how you resist. That's how the lights are turned on. That's how you discover uh, sin and evil in your own life. Doing what you're doing right now. Some of you are like, oh, man, I don't like this lesson because it's, 
it just keeps forcing me to the table. I really kind of like the whole sin idea. I'm like best friends with this area of sin in my life. I kind of like it. Yeah, no kidding. How about James 4.7? James 4.7. What you're really saying is I would rather exercise some level of autonomy over God or from God. But what does James 4.7 say? That doesn't work. As soon as you leave me behind, when you cross the road from the righteous way to the unrighteous way, you're screwed. <laughs> That's why he says what? What does James 4 say? Submit, therefore, to God. <laughs> that means stay lockstep with him. Keep your eyes on Christ. Not all the seductresses in this world, and there are many. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Never does the Bible say tangle with the devil. Never play with fire. You're going to get burned. And then finally go to 1 Peter. Actually, you know what? We'll save that. We'll save 1 Peter 5.8 and 5.9 because this principle will come up again on Sunday. So many good things going on <coughs> Excuse me, in these messages. Uh, <coughs> really, uh, we're going to be under a lot of attack, honestly. This is, the, this is the kind of stuff that our enemies, uh, I don't even, hate is not even a strong enough word. Uh, the last thing your enemy ever wants, any enemy of yours, is to be exposed. The last thing any of your enemies ever want is to be exposed. Because they know the power is in the deception. They, they know that they can do a lot more damage if you don't even know they're there. Just saying. So just gird your loins. It's a wonderful ride. Uh, it's transformational. You're going to have probably a whole new outlook on sin itself and the nature of it, the, decept the uh, deceitfulness of it. Uh, there's probably going to be conviction in your life where changes have to be evidenced, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But that's between you and the Lord. But this is really, really, truly good stuff. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to gather together and study your word. Thank you for equipping us. Thank you for making it uh, an ability to resist the devil. May we never cross that line and try to wrangle with him or sin itself, but rather just cast everything on your shoulders, Father, and depend on the Holy Spirit convicting ministry in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.